Today's lecture will focus on the first part and the very last part of chapter 22 from the Cary text, looking specifically at amines. Before we start looking at new material, let's go back and review some of the reactions we looked at in chapter 21. Um, this is the first one. Go ahead and pause the video for a second and attempt to come up with the name of the product. All right, here's the correct answer. This is a Claisen condensation reaction, and this ester is going to be plugged into another ester molecule. The answer for this makes more sense once we look at the mechanism. Ethoxide will deprotonate the alpha hydrogen to form an enolate. The enolate then plugs into the carbonyl group of another ester. The oxide intermediate drops its electrons down and bumps off the ethoxide, and we end up with our product right here. And this is the first four steps that we expect with any Claisen condensation. Uh, it's actually five steps total. The first three steps occur under base catalyzed conditions, and then the fourth step is inevitable. You add a base in order to start the reaction, so you can't stop the reaction with this acidic hydrogen here. You go past your product, and the acidic workup is required to get the product back. So we actually show the product twice, but if we asked for the mechanism on this reaction, this five steps would be the correct mechanism for a Claisen condensation. Naming this, the ester is the highest priority functional group. The longest continuous chunk of carbons that extends off the ester has one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. So this is a hexanoate. Coming off of the ester is an ethyl, so that goes all the way out in front. And then we list alphabetically the different substituents that are coming off of the hexanoate. One more example. This again is a review of the previous chapter. Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can come up with a correct answer for this question. Okay, in the last chapter, one of the key reactions that we looked at was the reaction of a beta keto ester with an alkyl group followed by saponification and decarboxylation. This one just kind of skips right to the saponification and decarboxylation. So ultimately, this is the last part of that EASD process, where S stands for saponification, and these two steps right here allow us to do the decarboxylation. Now, let's look at that mechanistically. This is the saponification reaction. This is the base catalyzed hydrolysis of an ester. This was one of the reactions that we looked at in chapter 20 on carboxylic acid derivatives. The hydroxide plugs into the carbonyl group to form the tetrahedral intermediate. The electrons collapse back down again and bump off the ethoxide as a leaving group. And you ended up making a carboxylic acid. But as, as always, whenever you have a carboxylic acid under basic conditions, you're going to deprotonate the carboxylic acid to get to the carboxylate. And if all we did was add potassium hydroxide in water, the reaction would stop right here at the beta keto carboxylate. Now what we're going to do is add in the acidic workup. And I, so here is the acidic workup mechanism. The carboxylate goes out and picks up a hydrogen off of hydronium. But in order to set up the next step, I need to rearrange the bond here. So this is just me twisting the bond and showing you how when you have a beta keto acid, which is a carboxylic acid right here, this hydrogen ends up bridging across the gap right here. And in the decarboxylation step, we're going to need to take advantage of that pseudo ring system. So I show it right here. This is just a bond rotation. It's not a mechanistic step. We could have gone straight across here. I just wanted to be ex uh, explicit in terms of how I was getting to this particular orientation. Moving on, the next step is the decarboxylation. And again, we could stop right here at this beta keto acid if we did the acidic workup and then didn't heat things up. So the decarboxylation does require heat to be added to the reaction. And the decarboxylation is a retro Diels Alder reaction that converts the beta keto acid into the enol. And then the final step is a tautomerization step. The tautomerization in this case is acid catalyzed. This ene all will kind of flip over to form the ketone. And you definitely would expect the ketone 
to be the major uh, major product of this reaction it wouldn't stay in the enol when I showed you this before I kinda ran all of these together saponification and then there's the decarboxylation which was the purple red and blue in this particular example I wanted to break up that decarboxylation to show you that there is a distinct acidic workup step and then you have the decarboxylation step and then you have a tautomerization step and this this is true for all of these acidic workup decarboxylations they go through these three steps right here oh and nomenclature uh, we finally need the name the final product um, this is a ketone the ketone dictates the number one position of the ring system and there is an alkene at the two position so two cyclopentenone okay now we're ready to start thinking about new material amines amines are the nitrogen equivalent of alcohols is an easy way to think about this we have a typical hydrocarbon chain without much going on and that's plugged into a nitrogen and this is kind of a boring amine as long as you ignore all the interesting stuff down here this is a more decorated amine and we're going to talk about the difference between that amine and this amine a little later they show up all over in biology that's what ubiquitous means they're everywhere lysine is a common amino acid it has this amine down here it has this amine right here but as soon as the amino acid is incorporated into a protein chain then that nitrogen plugs into a carbonyl group to become a peptide bond which organic call chem call organic chemists call peptides amides um, on the amines we're gonna look at three distinct things nomenclature the physical properties and then the spectroscopy so starting with nomenclature there's two different accepted ways of naming these the alkanamines is the first and alkylamines is the second this one is the one that I prefer and I really don't know which one is more common but this is the one I like because it makes more sense all you really do is just treat the compound like an alcohol so we have if this was an alcohol there would be four carbons so that would be one butanol and then we take the ol ending off and replace it with amine so this instead of being butanol it becomes butanamine if you just want to name it as an alkane you can do that and then take the e off so butane clip the e off and replace it with amine so it becomes butanamine still the other type this alkyl amine nomenclature is similar to functional class nomenclature where you simply state that it's an amine and then you state what carbons are coming off of it so this is butyl amine in this case we state that this is an amine looking at this alkyl amine nomenclature we look for the longest continuous chunk of carbons coming off of it which extending directly out from the nitrogen is one two three four so that would be a butyl amine with an ethyl group coming off the one position of the butyl amine and this is essentially functional class nomenclature where they remove this space and it runs out when you use functional class nomenclature it has to be a pretty simple compound for that to work that's why the alkanamine nomenclature gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of just pretending that's an alcohol naming the whole thing like an alcohol and then calling it an amine instead of an alcohol here's a couple practice problems that mix up the different uh, priority groups that we've looked at across chem 351 and chem 352 and for your entire kind of career of organic chemistry this represents the comprehensive list of nomenclature with one more thing to add on and we'll deal with those later so this compound right here has both an aldehyde and an amine the aldehyde is the higher priority functional group the amine is a lower priority functional group so this is a one two three four five carbon pentanal and at the one two three four position is an amino group there are two chiral centers on this compound this methyl group is technically a chiral center and the amino group represents another chiral center its chirality is R I didn't bother to specify if the methyl group is coming into or out of the plane of the screen because it doesn't matter this is at the alpha position and even if we tried to synthesize something that was chirally pure at this alpha position it would immediately racemize so while it's a chiral center it's not worth labeling as R or S here we have another compound there is both an amine on this compound and a thiol 
Thiols are very close to the re closely related to alcohols, so their priority is just a half step below them. Amines are a full step below those, so this is the most important functional group on the compound. Therefore, this is one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, this is a pentane thiol. And at the one, two, and four positions, we have an amino group and a methyl group. And unlike the aldehyde, the thiol doesn't scramble the stereochemistry of the methyl group, and so we need to designate the stereochemistry here as R, and this one is R as well. It didn't change. It was 4R here, and it's 4R right there. Last nomenclature example on this slide. There are an alcohol, and my amino group, and the halogens. Halogens, uh, no, they even showed up on the list. Their priority is rock bottom. Alcohols have higher priority than amine groups, so the longest continuous chunk of carbons that is connected to the alcohol is a one, two, three. So this is a propanol. At the one position, I have a bromo bromo, and at the three position, I have an amino group. So three amino, one dibromo, propan, two all. And that two could certainly go in between the dibromo and the propanol. This is one chiral center so I don't need to number it, I label it with an R right there. Amines can be much more complicated than alcohols can, and that's because the nitrogen can make up to three bonds. And in an alcohol, the oxygen makes two bonds, and one of them has to be to a hydrogen. So you're kind of limited in terms of what you can do with that. In a nitrogen, only one of those bonds in fact, none of the bonds have to be to hydrogens, and we still call it an amine. This is still an amine, even though the nitrogen doesn't have any hydrogens. So we end up with a primary amine, where the nitrogen is connected to one other thing that's not a hydrogen. Or this is a tertiary amine, where the nitrogen is connected to three things. None of them are hydrogens. And this one right down there is a secondary amine. It's got a carbon on this side, and a methyl group on that side, and one hydrogen. In terms of nomenclature, this one has its kind of a special name, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about aniline, and so it's worth knowing its common name, aniline. Here is a derivative of aniline, so once we call this thing aniline, then we've just named all of these pieces. That is now the number one position, so the number two position has that allyl group, and at the number four position I have a chloro group. You can't refer to this as ortho or para once you have more than two substituents on something. So we have to use numbers here. When you have substituents coming off of the nitrogen, we specify that with an N. And we saw this with amide nomenclature. So not a lot new here. If you just if you've left those N's off, your audience would think you had an aniline with two methyl groups that were somewhere on the benzene ring itself. So the N tells us that they're coming off of the nitrogen instead. Here's a diamine. I honestly don't even know if this compound would exist as a stable compound. Um, we just treat it like a diol. So this would be ethane diol, and we call it ethane diamine. If you didn't say the ones, that's what your audience would assume. So they get this even without the numbers. This one is interesting. Now we have two nitrogens on the compound, and we have to decide which one has more priority. If we look at what the name tells us, it's an ethane, so those are the two carbons right there. A diamine, meaning that there's two nitrogens on that ethane. Those two nitrogens are at the one and the two positions. And then coming off of N1 is a methyl group, meaning that the nitrogen that is more interesting is the one that has the methyl group. So that's the one that's coming off of carbon number one. And this nitrogen here coming off carbon number two would be my N2 group. In terms of the three-dimensional shape of these amines, they're uh, pretty standard tetrahedral atoms. So this is methylamine is the uh, kind of that functional class nomenclature for it. Some of you might be familiar with that from a TV show that ran on AMSC for a while. Methanamine follows the nomenclature rules that I'm going to try to stick to. And this is the nitrogen. So here's the methyl group, and there's the nitrogen. I kind of showed the nitrogen lone pair right here because while it, it isn't included in the molecular geometry, we talk about it in terms of the electron geometry. And that 106 degree bond angle there and the 112 degree bond angle right there are what you'd expect for something that's sp3 hybridized, where it's supposed to be 109.5. But it kind of deviates a little because of the lone pair.
Compared to amides, if you remember amides, the nitrogen lone pair actually gets sucked up into resonance delocalization. And so amide nitrogens typically are sp2 hybridized, amine nitrogens are typically sp3 hybridized, unless they're not. And a classic case of that is aniline. So this nitrogen right there has one, if you count the lone pair, two, three, if you count the bonds to the hydrogens, and four, when you count the phenyl ring, it has four electron groups. Things that have four electron groups typically are sp3 hybridized. If you consider the other resonance structures that exist for aniline, and these are not the ones we typically show because they have formal charges, but they definitely exist, you'll notice that that lone pair gets pulled down into a pi bond, and that requires the nitrogen to adopt an sp2 hybridization. And so these resonance structures help us understand that this nitrogen is sp2-ish. But in these three resonance structures right here, you actually, um, these are not the, the preferred resonance structures, so the nitrogen is also sp3-ish. And so what they find experimentally is that the hybridization is somewhere between sp3 and sp2. It's kind of weird. The point of this slide is that these lone pairs get sucked down into the ring system and that's going to affect their chemistry moving forward. And we'll come back to this idea later on when we kind of dedicate special time to aniline. Looking at some specific physical properties, and we're gonna look at the ability of amines to form hydrogen bonds, and then the boiling point of primary, secondary, and tertiary amines. Let's start with the second question. We're gonna look horizontally right here. These are isomers of each other, meaning that they have similar, actually they have the same molar mass, and so they should have fairly similar properties unless there's something interesting going on. And the boiling points are quite a bit different. You'll notice 50 degrees Celsius for this compound, 34 degrees Celsius for this compound, and then drops all the way down to 3 degrees Celsius. And this is a tertiary amine, this is a secondary amine, and this is a primary amine. And the difference in boiling point has to do with the ability of the compound to form hydrogen bonds. When you have a nitrogen that has hydrogens that it can give in a hydrogen bond and a lone pair that it can receive in a hydrogen bond, then that's going to make the compound um, have stronger intermolecular forces of attraction and increase your boiling point. When you get to this tertiary amine over here, there's no more hydrogen bonds that it can make with itself, so your boiling point drops down quite a bit. And that compares nicely with an oxygen-containing analog. So here I have a bunch of isomers of nitrogen-containing compounds, and here are some isomers of oxygen-containing compounds. And when neither the nitrogen-containing compound nor the oxygen-containing compound can make hydrogen bonds, then we see similar boiling point characteristics. But when the oxygen and the nitrogen can both make hydrogen bonds, what you'll notice is that the oxygen has a much higher boiling point. And this suggests that the strength of the oxygen-hydrogen-hydrogen bond is much stronger than the strength of the nitrogen-hydrogen-hydrogen bond. And this is because of electronegativity differences. Now let's start looking at spectroscopy. Before we jump into spectroscopy, let's pause for a minute and see what information we can gain simply from the molecular formula of nitrogen-containing compounds. For nitrogen-containing compounds, one of the common features is that they tend to have an odd number of hydrogens, and this is rare. For um, C4H11 nitrogen, notice that the hydrogens are an odd number. Here we have C4H5, the hydrogens are still an odd number. And this is C3H8, which is an even number, but that's because we have two nitrogens in the compound. So an odd number of nitrogens will produce an odd number of hydrogens. And the way to think about the index of hydrogen deficiency is that the number of hydrogens you expect to have is equal to the number of carbons, in this case 4, times 2, plus 2. So this part is kind of standard. 4 times 2 plus 2 is based just on the number of carbons. And then we have to add in one more expected hydrogen for every nitrogen that is present. So I would expect a formula of C4H11N to have 11 hydrogens, it does have 11 hydrogens, 
when I subtract out the number of expected hydrogens that I calculate from the number of actual hydrogens that I observe and divide by two, that gives me an index of hydrogen efficiency of zero, which matches the structure that I'm looking at right here. For this compound, the number of hydrogens is generally predicted by the number of carbons. If you have four carbons, then four times two plus two is 10. I expect to see 10 hydrogens, but then I have to add in an additional expected hydrogen for every nitrogen that I encounter in the structure. So I expect 11 hydrogens based on the fact that there are four carbons and one nitrogen. My 11 expected hydrogens minus my five actual hydrogens gives me six missing hydrogens. We divide that by two and we say that we're missing three hydrogen pairs. Those three hydrogen pairs, one of them is because of the ring, one of them because of the pi bond, and one of them because of the other pi bond. Once we have two nitrogens in the compound, then the number of expected hydrogens is still two times the number of carbons plus two. So three carbons times two is six plus two is eight. And then we add in expected hydrogens for each of the nitrogens. So I have 10 expected hydrogens. I only have eight in my formula. So my index of hydrogen deficiency of, is one, and that's the ring system that I have right there. Now the spectroscopy, what we want to focus on are what new things show up because of the nitrogen when we're looking at spectroscopy for amine compounds. And the nitrogen itself in IR spectroscopy doesn't necessarily leave good indications. Instead, what we see is that the relationship between a nitrogen and a hydrogen leaves two indications in your spectroscopy. The first is the stretching vibration. This occurs, so here's my x-axis of, uh, of a typical IR spectrum, and between about 3,000 and 3,500 is where we see these peaks that occur because the nitrogen-hydrogen bond stretches. Additionally, the nitrogen-hydrogen bond can bend, and it tends to produce peaks around 1,600. So here's an example of that. So here's my compound right here. It's got this triple bond, and then there's an NH2 group right there the nitrogen-hydrogen bond will bend and that tends to produce this peak at about 1600. And this is normally where you expect to see carbon-carbon double bond peaks show up or maybe even a, a carbonyl peak that wandered a little low. But this doesn't look like a carbonyl peak. It's not nearly long enough and it is wider than you typically expect a carbon-carbon double bond peak to be. This is the bending vibration of nitrogen-hydrogen bonds. If you have stretching vibrations, they tend to show up here where the alcohol is. And the examples that I pulled from your textbook are really nice and clean. And that's not been my experience when I look at data that's gathered in the laboratory. This is kind of that messy data that we typically expect. And hopefully you realize this shows up where alcohols typically show up, but it does not look like an alcohol. They tend to be uh, more pointed. They're not quite as broad. They're not nearly as symmetrical. This is common for nitrogen-hydrogen stretching in the IR spectroscopy. Other types of spectroscopy, well, the proton NMR spectroscopy is very similar to alcohols with lower shift values. So here I have ethanol, and here's ethanamine. You'll notice that the hydrogen directly connected to the oxygen and ethanol shows up at 4.78, or at least that's what ChemDraw thinks it's going to do and the hydrogen connected to a nitrogen shows up at 2.07. That's even lower than the hydrogen connected to a carbon. And that has something to do with the fact that nitrogen has a lone pair that can kind of bleed over here into the electron density of the hydrogen. So proton NMR doesn't really give you good indications of a nitrogen-hydrogen containing compound. And it's really the best indication you have that you have an amine present in your compound is the IR spectroscopy or what they'll often do is run a D2O exchange reaction. And what they'll, they'll show you all the peaks that you get under a non-deuterated solvent, and then they'll repeat that with the peaks you get under deuterated solvent, and the nitrogen-hydrogen peaks disappear when we add D2O. And we saw that before with carboxylic acids and alcohols and even amides. Any type of hydrogen that can make hydrogen bonds will disappear when you add D2O as a solvent in proton NMR spectroscopy. C13 NMR spectroscopy is also not that helpful. The carbon that is directly connected to the nitrogen shows up in the ballpark of 30 to 40, which is higher than a typical carbon, but not higher enough to really kind of stand out.
Carbons that are bound to an alcohol show up usually uniquely in this area around 60 to 80 and are easy to spot when you have a carbon bound to a nitrogen, much harder to see what's going on. Mass spec is actually fairly useful for these compounds, probably the most useful of the spectroscopy for trying to identify a nitrogen, and that's usually because you see an odd numbered molar mass. So here's my mass spectrum. I'm assuming this is my molecular ion peak out here at 101. as an odd value, so I would think there's probably a nitrogen connected to that compound. Nitrogen is also a common break point when compounds shatter in your mass spectroscopy instrument. And they break not directly at the nitrogen, but one position over. So in this particular compound that gave rise to a molecular ion peak at 101, the nitrogen will double down on one of the adjacent carbons and break off the thing hanging off of the carbon. And usually it's the largest chunk of carbons it breaks off. So this nitrogen carbon double bond will form and this propyl group will fall off. And that represents a loss of a propyl group. That's 30, 43 units of mass. So we drop from 101 down to 58. And that's that 43 mass loss. And you might be able to see that. Hopefully you have other forms of spectroscopy that don't require you to dig that deep into mass spec. Usually the odd value tells you that you've got a nitrogen in the compound, and if you're desperate, then you have to look at these gaps and think what could have fallen off at one position away from the carbon that would weigh 43 units of mass. So now let's think of a compound. Um, let's try to build one from the data. And so um, go ahead and pause this for a second and try to solve this problem on your own, and then come back and we'll look at the answer. All right, where to start? Well, you have the molecular formula, so let's start there. The index of hydrogen deficiency is based on the number of carbons and the number of nitrogens. So for eight carbons, I would expect to see, you multiply that eight by two and add two, so eight times two is 16, plus two is 18, and then I add in uh, one for any nitrogen that's present, so I should have 19 hydrogens if this is just a regular alkane connected to a nitrogen. But it's not. There aren't 19 hydrogens, there are 11. So I'm missing eight hydrogens. You divide that by two, that means I'm missing four pairs of hydrogens. My index of hydrogen deficiency is four. And usually when you see an index of hydrogen deficiency of four, you immediately become suspicious of a benzene ring. And sometimes that shows up a little bit in your uh, IR spectroscopy, but a better place to look is often in your NMR spectroscopy. Carbons that are part of a benzene ring will make unique peaks between about 120 and 150. I've got some peaks that are a little lower than that, but it looks like I have my one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. There's my six carbons that could reasonably be found inside of a benzene ring. Then I have two carbons showing up down here, and they're down in the alkane region. So the C8 suggests a benzene ring with two alkyl groups hanging off of the benzene ring. Um, additional evidence for the benzene ring, well, there's kind of the four-fingered squiggle right there, but that's not good evidence. You've got some peaks above 3,000, some peaks below 3,000, and then right around 1,600, this is a little wider than you typically expect to see a carbon-carbon double bond. And so this is probably a nitrogen-hydrogen wag right there. But it's these two peaks that are important, uh, occurring at about 675 and close to 800. Two distinct peaks usually suggest that my benzene ring is mono-substituted or meta-disubstituted. And it's most likely meta-disubstituted. The reason for that is when it's mono-substituted, there's a lot of symmetry in your benzene ring, and you wouldn't expect to see six distinct carbon peaks. So I have a meta-disubstituted benzene ring with two alkyl groups and a nitrogen with at least one hydrogen wagging. And that one hydrogen also appears to be stretching out here. That's all I've got from these two spectra right here. If we look now at the mass spec, the molecular ion peak, that's 125, 24, 23, 22, 21. 121, that would be my molecular ion peak right there and you'll notice that there is a very, very large M-1 peak. And that's helpful, because what it shows me 
going back to this example right here, is the nitrogen tends to break off things that are on the other side of the adjacent carbons. And if you see a large M-1 peak, that means that your nitrogen is connected to a methyl group. Uh, it's right next to a carbon that is breaking off something that has a mass of 1, so that would be a hydrogen. Mechanistically, that looks like this. This is the correct answer right here. The nitrogen is breaking off a bond of an adjacent carbon. This hydrogen pops off. That's why you get that big M-1 peak. And um, there's the meta. So we have the two peaks in the IR spectra. Hopefully you came up with this one. This is a hard compound to come up with from the data given. You would hope that somebody would throw you some proton NMR data, and I would have if it would have fit on the slide.